the Holy Ghost goosebumps going on. Yeah. Amen. Y'all just like, whoa, yeah. We didn't want to stop, did you all? We'll no. get back in there. Hey, welcome to Communion Sunday. You can have a seat real quick. Uh, if you did not get one and we have any left, first time in history we were running short on communion, which is interesting. But here's the good news. Jesus' blood never runs out. That's right. Amen. So if you're saved, say amen. amen. If you're not, say oh my. Okay, <laughs> I just tricked some of y'all. Let's have an altar call right now. Hey, uh, communion is never really the same here at Change Life Church. I don't have a script. I just pray that God, you just you know, speak through me. Uh, why we take it? Uh, Jesus said, "When you do this, do this in remembrance of me." It, it is a remembrance of what Jesus did for us. The blood representing, or the juice representing His blood, the wafer representing His body. And for me personally, uh, communion is so important because He saved me from hell. That's what this means to me. Like, this is the remembrance of what he did. And today, let me, let me tell you, if you do not know Jesus, okay, and you refuse to accept him, you get to spend eternity in hell for, the, for all of eternity paying for your own sins. Jesus came to pay the price for you. 
but you have to accept that. And so if you're in this place or you're, you're watching online and you've never asked Jesus to be your savior, you've never asked him to forgive you of your sins, and right now would be the perfect time to do that. Just in your heart, out loud, however you do that, God knows where your heart's at, but just to give your life to him. For the rest of us, okay, if you've given your life to Jesus, salvation is good. You, you, when you go to heaven, I'm sorry, when you die, you go to heaven. This reminds me, number one, that I'm forgiven. Number two, I need to forgive. The Bible's clear before you take communion. It says, examine your heart. And if there's forgiveness that you need, ask for it. If there's forgiveness that you need to give, just say, tell God, God, I forgive this person. And again, you don't have to like them, but you do have to love them. But to forgive is so important. Why? Because it sets you free. Amen? And so during this time, again, we don't normally have our prayer team up here, but the altars are always open up here. If there's something you need to come up and just lay down before the Lord, please do that. Uh, and once you take communion on your own, uh, just get back into worship. And let's have expectation of what God's going to do, like in the next couple songs. Amen? Because I expect God's going to do something good.
Down fights 
There's no wall you won't kick down Lie you wouldn't tear down Coming after you There's no shadow you won't light up Mountain you won't climb up Coming after me There's no wall you won't kick down Lie you won't tear down Come, come on church, if you believe that this morning, lift your voice. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up to come after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me, yes, There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up. down for you. Maybe it's been something that's been spoken over you from maybe as a child or as an adult, maybe by a spouse, by a pastor, by a friend, whatever it may be. I believe this morning, someone, you need to lay down the words that have been spoken over you. I know for me, that's something I'm working on. Words that were spoken over me as a young girl that weren't true about me and my family. Of At 33 years old, I'm really just now having to really look at it. I'm like, no, that's not who I am. So this song today was selfishly a little bit for me, if that's okay but I also know that it's for someone in this room. That there's been something spoken over you that you have held on to. And I'm telling you right now in this moment, let the love of God overwhelm you. Let his presence overwhelm you in this moment. Just give it to him. And that's all you have to do is simply say, God, I give it to you. I choose not to believe that lie. So we're gonna sing that bridge again. And I wanna encourage you, if that's you this morning, I want you to lift your hands as we start to sing. And I want you to lay it at his feet. God's got big shoulders. He can handle it. He's longing for you to give it to him and say, child, let me, let me speak over you the words that I have over you. So come on, let's sing that again. There's no shadow. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, come on after me. There's no wall you won't get down, lie you won't tear down, come on after me. There's no shadow you won't, mountain you won't. There's no wall you won't keep down, lie you won't tear. Still you give 
go along with what Kristen was just talking about. The book of 1 Corinthians tells us we, we take every thought captive, every lofty thing that rises itself up against the knowledge of God, we take it captive and we take it before him. Whatever's been spoken over you, whatever has happened to you in the past, pastor's gonna get into it, I don't wanna steal his thunder today, but right now, in this moment, we take everything captive to the obedience of Christ, anything that would rise itself up against the knowledge of God that says, you find your identity in him, we bring that to his throne this morning and we cast it at his feet. We say enough is enough, I'm done, that is not who I am. Maybe that's who I was, but it is not who I am. And sometimes we put a period where God puts a comma and he says, no, I have something more for you, something better for you, and it's an identity that you would find in me. We take it captive this morning by the name that is above every name. That that false identity over you that thing that happened to you in the past, we take it captive this morning to the obedience of Christ. We bring it to him where the sacrifice was made for us that the curse would be broken and that we would live a life fulfillment of the blessing of the Lord. And that is where we stand now. I am not who I was. You are not who you were anymore. Once you did these things, the book of Colossians tells us, but you don't do those things no more. Once you were identified by those things, but you are not identified by that anymore because in Christ there is neither slave nor free, Jew nor Gentile. There is none of that. We are all one, sons and daughters of the living God. He is not dead. Oh, he is alive, he is well, and he is here to redeem the position that you are in today. Father, we thank you for the freedom that we have in Christ. We take every thought captive, everything that would rise itself up against the knowledge of God. We take it captive this morning and we bring it before your throne. We bring all of, all of our mess. Jesus, me, Pastor Stevie, I bring my mess to you this morning and I lay it at your feet. And Father, it says in your word that you are big enough and strong enough to carry our burdens. And so we lay them down with you. And Father, we walk away free. What a gift we have. What good news we have been given, Jesus, of the sacrifice that you've made for us. We worship you. We praise you. Father, let this good news ring through the streets of Cuna, of good news, of freedom that has come. We give you all the praise. We give you all the glory because only you are worthy. Let us experience your love in a new and a fresh way this morning. All the praise, all the glory belongs to you in Jesus' name. And everyone said... Lift up a shout of praise to Jesus. He's good and he is worthy. Find someone around you. Tell them they're looking fantastic and blessed this morning. We love you guys. Well, welcome, welcome, welcome to church. We're glad you are here. We're already off to an amazing start today, and I'm excited to see what God's going to continue to do in service. But if you are with us for the first time, we just want to say thank you so much for taking time out of your Sunday morning to be here. We're excited you're with us, but we want to meet you, so make sure at the end of service you head back to the information area. We have a booth over there. It says connect on it. If you don't mind filling out a connect card today, we'd really appreciate it. It's not so we can stalk you. It's simply so we as a staff know who you are and how we can best serve you and your household. So we're looking forward to doing that. Uh, And then also make sure you leave here today with the Change Life coffee mug. It's our way of saying thank you for being here today. A lot of churches give away coffee mugs, but ours is the best. Uh, Just so you know, ours holds the best coffee and uh, it tastes better. It's just a little bit better when it's in that mug. I'm telling you right now, it's amazing. But anyways, hey, I got a couple quick announcements. Uh, First up, life groups are happening, so make sure that you are aware of your life group schedule. We are excited that life groups are going on. 
We're looking forward to all of it. Just make sure you know the schedule. I know if like our men's group is coming up, our men's life group, and they're doing a fishing thing next Saturday, or sorry, not next, this Saturday, so in six days, and kids are welcome. So make sure, men, you're aware of that. Uh, the information for that is available online, or you can talk to Aaron. His contact information is also available online, or he's in the back there hanging out. So make sure you grab him. And uh, any questions you have about that, you can get that done. And then uh, one thing we do have going on, uh, we have Easter eggs in the back. We are looking forward to a great Easter this year. I am pumped. I'm excited. Uh, we had over 850 people last year for Easter uh, at the high school. We're going to be doing it at the high school again. We're looking forward to it. We want to we want to break 900. I would love to see that happen. Not because I care about numbers, because I care about impact, and I really want to see the good news of Jesus go forward. Uh, but anyways, we need help with Easter eggs. Uh, the information is inside of each bag. But if you don't mind taking a bag or two or 17 home and uh, filling them with pre-wrapped candy, that would be a huge help. We're looking forward to just blessing the kids in our community uh, with a bunch of free candy. So make sure you, if you're able to do so, you can do that. Just please don't like put chocolate in it because the chocolate melts. And then uh, also like don't open a bag of Skittles and pour it in there uh, because it needs to be pre-wrapped. Like if you open something and you wrap it, that's not called pre-wrapped. That's called post-open wrapped. Okay. <laughs> So we, we want pre-wrapped candy. So just be aware of that. Again, the information is all in the bag. Check it out. Uh, but other than that, we do have Next Steps tonight. You say, what is Next Steps? That means you probably need to go to it. Uh, Next Steps is a free dinner that we offer here at the church. It is for those who are new to the church. So if you've been coming for three, four, five, six months, whatever, and you have not yet come to Next Steps, we would love to have you for dinner tonight. It's at 5 o'clock right here in this room. We're going to have a good time hanging out. Again, completely free. You just need to sign up in the back so we can prepare tables and know exactly how much to set up for. So set, uh, sign up for it. 5 o'clock, again, be here tonight, have a good time for dinner, and I promise to get you out of here by 6 p.m. We've never gone over, and it will not happen today, ladies and gentlemen, I'm telling you right now. But hey, we're looking forward to a great night of Next Steps. If not, make sure you check out your life group schedule, because some life groups are meeting. Other than that, as we receive tithes and offerings, we just want to say thank you uh, and your partnership as we reach our city, as we reach our community with the good news of Jesus Christ, the experience that you have right now in your seat, we want all of CUNA to experience that. And so if you would, please partner with us through your giving. We appreciate it. You can give online. You can text to give. You can mail it in or drop it off in one of the boxes. Either way, thank you, thank you, thank you for your partnership through your giving as we reach our city for Jesus. Pastor Stan. Amen. Thanks, Pastor Stevie. Well, good morning, church. Wow. Never, ever, ever get tired of the presence of God. Amen. I come to church not to get religion, and get connection with Jesus. Just to, you know, we should be in there all week, but somehow corporately when we get together, something happens in this place. And uh, so thankful that you're open to it, that you're open to it. Uh, good word, Pastor Stevie. I had a little note, and I'm like, I want him to preach next week because I didn't talk to him about it because we like to tag team on the next part of the story. And, uh, and so it was great. I was like, just preach it now, man, then I won't have to. <laughs> But some of y'all need to hear what I have to say, um, and so uh, he'll be nice to you next week. We have good pastor, bad pastor. I, I beat you up, and he loves on you. It just it works out pretty good. Um, but anyhow, if you're here for the first time, thank you so much for being here. I know it's a it can be kind of a scary thing going to a new church. Sometimes you don't know what to expect. Are they going to be crazy? Are they going to be playing with snakes? Are they going to you know speak in tongues over me? Um, I do speak in tongues. I don't play with snakes. Don't really care for snakes, uh, but they'll freak me out. But a couple of things I want to let you know. So our building is getting closer. Uh, we, it was such the timeline was so close to Easter that we're pushing for Easter, but we're still going to the high school because we have inflatables for the kids and our the, the ball fields are a mess and stuff right now. Uh, but one thing that I need to let you know is it's locked now. We started locking the building. Um, we've been given tours and stuff, but we have open electrical panels. So unless you want your kids uh, zapped by the power of God... Um, no, we, we want that zapping, but not the, not the real zapping. Um, and so the, because the electrical panels and stuff are open, we're not letting people just go running crazy. And there's, you know what kids do? They run in and they touch things. I went to change life shirts. It was a shocking, shocking experience. Uh, we don't want to do that, but open panels... And, uh, but tonight, if you come the next steps to the dinner, uh, we are going to give you a tour of it. Uh, but we're getting close. We've got the LED wall up, which if you didn't see that on Facebook, it's awesome. Uh, so I'm really excited about what's happening over there. So... Before we get into this, I want to tell you a story. Um, if you've been here very long, I've been here 27 years, my wife and I have, and uh, if you've been here very long, you've heard this story probably once, two or three times. Uh, Georgianne has it memorized because she's been here longer than me. She's one of three that have been here longer than me, and Laura Brothers, if she's here. Uh, but I had a horse. Back in the old days when we moved to Idaho, when Meridian was still farmland, 
uh, we had 10 acres in the middle of Meridian, and we had horses. And I had a horse named Major, and he was a gelding, pretty low-key, not too, not too, not too high-spirited. And, uh, and I had him down at the other end of the field, and I needed to take him to the other end of the pasture. So I had my saddle, and I did not have a bit. Normally, he had a halter and a bit. Uh, I didn't have that, but I just had a normal halter and a lead rope, and I put this, what is called a bozel, which just goes over his nose. And so I put my saddle on, didn't cinch it tight because I wasn't planning on going very far. And so I got on him, and we're moseying, and he kind of figures out that there's no bit in his mouth. And so he starts trotting, and then he starts running, and he's going and going. I have no control over the thing. I just have the lead rope and, and the bozel, and I'm like, ah! And then he makes a hard right. I made a hard left. And we're flying off because the saddle was loose, and I held on to the lead rope. I was not going to be defeated by this 1,000-pound beast, and it's dragging a 135-pound human through, the, through that. I'm holding on, and, it's, and I'm just, oh, I'm like, you're not going to win, and it's dragging me. And finally, he stopped, and he, stu- he looks at him, and he's like, you're an idiot. <laughs> it's like, Ed, and, I, and I'm like, but I won, and then I realized that I didn't win, Butch. I realized that my back was completely road rashed. I was bleeding, and I was like, why did I hold on? Why, why did I hold on? Because what you hold on to can hinder you. Yeah. And so today we're going to be talking about, that is the title of my message, what you hold on to can hinder you. The problem was, this is called a what? Lead. A lead rope. And yes, we still have a horse. <laughs> Love you, Lauren. <laughs> San Diego, I got your horse. <laughs> yeah. The kids may leave, but the horses stay. And you're like, okay, somebody's got to feed the horse. <laughs> I drive by, I'm like, you're on your own. Uh, you've lived for thousands of years foraging. All right, it's called a, what? a lead rope. And what became, or what was a lead rope became a drag rope. And you have to know when to let go of things. Because if you don't know when to let go of things, they will drag you through the field of life and you will be at the end of the pasture, bloody beaten, and your pride may be intact, maybe not. But why I held on was my pride. My pride said, this thing is not going to beat me when the horse is like, if you would just let go, I wouldn't drag you through the field. Life does not stop for you. Have you ever noticed that? When life hurts, life does not stop. So we're going to go to 1 Samuel. We're going to continue from last week's story and uh, recap just a little bit. Uh, King Saul was the first king of Israel. Israel wanted a king, and God's like, you don't want a king. And they're like, no, we want a king. And, you know, you pray long enough, oftentimes God will give you what you want. But what you want is often not what you need. Right. And, and God felt replaced here. And Samuel was the prophet, kind of felt replaced. But they picked this guy named Saul who was a head taller than everybody else. He started out really good, started out very humble. Matter of fact, when they were going to king him, he was hiding in the baggage. I mean, he was just like hiding down. And they, they got him out. Well, he became a king. And then he let the power get to his head. He started making bad decisions, and there were several times that God said to do something, and he didn't do it, and he became a little bit rebellious, a little bit prideful in his heart. And there was a group of people called the Amalekites, who we discussed last week, that God said, I'm going to punish them, and I need you to wipe them off the face of the They're like a cancer to society. They're a very evil, very immoral people. They had sexual immorality in ways that we can't discuss in church. It was that evil of a group. And God said, I just need you to wipe them all out, okay, can basically eradicate the virus of, of sinful behavior, uh, because that's what I want you to do. And so Saul goes and he, he says, wipe out men, women, children, and it sounds, I mean, if, you don't, if you don't get this, go to last week, okay, go listen to last week's message, animals, everything, but Saul didn't do it. Saul only partially obeyed, he only wiped out the bad animals, and he kept the king alive, it's kind of a trophy and God called him on it. And basically, partial obedience is complete disobedience. Like, there's, there's no such thing as I halfway obeyed. A half, half disobedience is full disobedience. And so God says, I'm removing you as the king. Now, this process wasn't an immediate process. It's not like a human where we're like, okay, we're going to you know, take your little king sticker and your crown and you're done. This would be, if you go through the timeline, about a 20 to 22-year period of him losing his throne. It wasn't an overnight thing. So you go through the timeline of the Bible, and he would lose that position, but it would be a slow position. Losing his position was a process, kind of like a lame duck president, or in my case, hair loss over time. Every time I, Pastor Steve got a great haircut this week, I was joking that he gets a haircut and mine just falls out. So it's kind of there, but your time's coming, bro. Your time's coming. I hope he has his good hair forever. But, uh, but the Apostle Paul, 
uh, says in Acts 13.21, if you like biblical knowledge, that Saul was king over 40 years. So there's biblical proof that he was king for quite some time. Again, the Apostle Paul saying 40 years. So Saul would be king another 20 to 22 years after this event. And David would be training to be the new king eventually. Now, timeline, historians believe that David, when this incident happened where Samuel said, you're no longer going to be king, that, that David was not even born yet. Pretty fascinating. You go back and look at the timeline, there's like a lot of truth to that. It, David wasn't even born yet, and yet God said, I have somebody that I'm going to raise up that, that's, that's going to be better than you. That's the words in the NIV, he's better than you. And that's kind of like, ouch. You ever have somebody compare you to a sibling? And your siblings, like, they're better than you? Why can't you be like your brother? I often wonder, in Mary's home, when Jesus was growing up, did she look at her other children and say, why can't you be like Jesus? <laughs> did James, his brother, ever said to Jesus, you just think you're so perfect? <laughs> and because Jesus is the truth, he said, I am. <laughs> right? There's something to that. We know that we can't be perfect. But David is not even born yet. Given this information, this is why it's important to know this. So according to Bible, according to the timeline, uh, there's about a 10-year gap between chapter 15, verse 35, and chapter 16, when Saul begins to lose his kingship. And there's a question that we're going to get into that it, we have to ask, okay, why is this question being asked? We have to know, like, what is the tone going on here? And so we'll start in chapter 15, verse 34 and 35. It's not on the screen because I added this after we did the slides. And it says this, Then Samuel left for Ramah. This is after he told uh, King Saul that he would not be king anymore. It says, But Saul went up to his home in Gibeah of Saul. So they parted ways. And until the day Samuel died, he did not go see Saul again, though Samuel mourned for him. And the Lord was grieved that he had made Saul king over Israel. And I asked these questions to myself why was Samuel mourning? And if it truly has been about 10 years that has gone by that Samuel is still mourning, he's mourning, why did he mourn? Did he miss this relationship that he had with, with King Saul, like the first king of Israel, and they were kind of buddies, they talked, it, it was a mentor thing. Were they good friends, most likely? Did Samuel see this as maybe a failed relationship on his part? Because he did the best he knew how to do to help Saul be a good king and make good decisions. And yet Saul, as many of your children have done, and I say it seriously, have disobeyed what you have preached and what you have lived and went off and did their own thing. Was, was there a brokenness here that many of you may know because you have a wayward child? That you're like, they know better, but they just got to figure this out on themselves. Let me tell you something. Your wayward child is not your responsibility. It's God's. Okay? It's God's. You let the Holy Spirit be the Holy Spirit. I've always noticed when I try to be the Holy Spirit, I do a pretty poor job. It's never well received when I try to be the Holy Spirit. I'm sure there's many times that God has said, let me do my job. And if I keep going, I'm like, but I know how to do better. And that's a dangerous place to be, isn't it? But was it a failed relation? Was it the fact that Samuel saw Saul with a self-destruction going on? You know, we are all equipped, all equipped with a self-destruction button. Every single one of us. We can self-destruct. I don't know why he was so deeply affected by this loss, but if indeed 10 years have gone by and he's still sad, he's still mourning this loss, we see that God was grieved and Samuel is holding on to this thing. Is he holding on to something that's hindering him? And so as we go into this question, here's how I want to look at this. What's God's tone here? What's God's tone when he asks this question? You know, one of the dangerous things about text messaging is you can't tell tone all the time. Have you ever had your caps lock on and you didn't realize it and you're like, ah, and you get it and you're like, whoa, are you mad? You're like, no, why? Because you're all caps. Some people live like all caps, right? And then you got the sneaky ones who are all lowercase, but they're like little nuclear bombs that will go up. Well, what God, what's God's tone here? Here's what I think it is. Let's look at this verse. I think it's soft. I think it's a soft tone. I think, again, just speculating on timeline, looking at what historians say. I think after maybe 10 years that God has seen Samuel grieving. And here's, how my, here's my take on this. And I believe that, that God looked at Samuel, and I'm going to ad-lib just a little bit, and he was like, because he talked to Samuel, he's like, hey, hey Samuel, yes, Lord, I've got a question for you. Okay, Lord, what, what do you got? Um, I don't think God would ever say, um, but how, how long are you going to mourn 
for Saul. I'm just curious. I, I, you've been 10 years. Man, I know it broke your heart. I know you lost a relationship. I know you haven't seen him since. And I'm just wondering, how, how long are you going to grieve? Because I got something for you to do. But, man, your heart still broke. How, how long are you going to hurt for something that you can never gain back? Because I rejected Saul for his behavior. He just wasn't making it. I got a new king coming. But, but Sammy, how long? How long are you going to mourn for him? Do you kind of get that vibe? Because I've never really read it that way. I mean, I've read this Bible my whole life, and I was always like, hey, how long are you going to mourn for this guy, man? At the, but I, I felt a softness in my heart when I was putting this message together that God's like, no, no, my tone was easy. Because I love Samuel. He's just heartbroken. I was grieved too, but, but I, how long are you going to mourn for him? Because you can't move on if you're still mourning. It's okay to be grieving. It's okay to have some sadness. And it's not like it's ever going to change, but it can heal. It can get better. But, but Sammy, how long, how long are you going to mourn for him? I've rejected him as king over Israel. And he says, fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I'm going to send you to Jesse of Bethlehem. And I have chosen one of his sons to be king. Now, at this point, David was born. David was between 10 and 15 years old. Josephus, the, the historian of the day, puts David at about 10 years old. Some other scholars put him about 15. And so what we'll say he's between 10 and 15 years old at this point. It's probably closer to 10 or 12 because I'm smarter than the scholars and Josephus. Uh, so we're going to say 12 and a half. Law of averages, right? We'll just put it right there. We'll say he's 12-ish. But God has his tone. And so the question is, how long will you hold on what you lo- to what you lost and can't change? And that's my question for you today. That's my question for myself. Is, is how long am I going to hold on to something that, that has a hold on me? Because you hold on to something long enough, it becomes a hold on you. What, what was a lead rope becomes a tow rope. And that's not God's plan for your life, right? Leading and towing is two different, totally, totally different things. God wants to know today how long will you hold on to what you lost and can't change. Again, the scholars are correct. It hasn't been days but years, and what you're holding on to is hindering you. And God is telling Samuel, I have new plans. He said, it's going to get better. David, and he didn't give him a name yet. He says, this new king, he's going to be a good king. Like, I, I know what I'm doing. We kind of made a mistake. God didn't make a mistake, but Saul didn't live up to what we was hoping. But this, this new king I've got, he's good. He's good. I've seen this in, in remarriages. Way too much focus on the ex that it ruins the current relationship. I've seen that happen. And again, I believe that there are places biblically that divorce can happen. But you know what my, my personal opinion is when it says God hates divorce? It's not that God hates you because you got divorced. Boy, hear me on that because there are some preachers that will tell you. Like if you got divorced, that, it's, that God's meant. No, that is absolutely a lie. What I believe that God hates is the casualties of divorce, the custody battles, the bad-mouthing, the things that go along with, with a divorce, because a divorce isn't just a decision. It goes on and on and on, and those of you who have been, you need to understand it's under the blood of Jesus. You, you, there's, there's forgiveness and all that. I'm, not talking, I'm talking about the pain, that, the residual pain. I think that's what breaks God's heart, okay? And this isn't a preaching thing on divorce. It's just saying there are times that I have seen exes worry so much about the ex that they'll ruin their current relationship. Okay, there's a time that you got to say, okay, I got to deal with this, but that's not going to be my focus. Again, what you focus on is what you gravitate toward. And God is telling Samuel, hey, your grief is real. Notice that he didn't get on to Samuel for grieving. He didn't say, where's your faith, oh prophet of God? Why are you grieving? No, he said, your, your grief is real. God grieved. So God is not chastising him for grieving. What he is saying is for you to move on, you've got to let go. And I think that's what God is asking us to do, okay? So here's another sermon title, Don't Let Your Grief Become a Grip or a Gripe. Because what has a grip on you will become a gripe. Now, how many of you are, uh, you look at your expiration date on any type of food? Anybody do that, like you're looking at it? Got some out there, they're like, oh, yep. It expired today. That means the can's going to blow up and it's going to get bad. <laughs> Yesterday it was good, but it knows. This can of beans knows. Yeah. Like, I have an expiration date, and as soon as I hit it, baby, I am going to go nasty on y'all. Okay, <laughs> most of the time, it says they changed it. It's best buy date. They, they kind of, they know people say, and best buy date, that just says 
It's still good. It's still good. Like I ate a granola bar not too long ago. It was like three years expired. And I, I no, really, I opened up and there was nothing hanging on in there and I ate it. And then I was sick for six weeks. You all know that. Um, <laughs> but there's one time I had a granola bar that I cut open. I'm, I keep this pair of children's scissors in my door of my pickup, specifically for opening granola bars. I know. And they're safety ones, they're, they're, so I don't cut myself. So, so I cut it open, and I'm going down Meridian Road, and, and I'm eating. I was like, man, that's going to taste kind of strange. And I looked down, and no kidding, there was dead weevils in there. And I'm like, okay, that's probably not one I want to keep eating. But I will tell you. If it doesn't smell bad, your pastor's eating it, all right? (laughs) Pastor Stevie's keeping himself healthy in case I fall over from eating something that I shouldn't eat. But there's an expiration date on certain things. None of us know ours. But here's what I want to encourage you to do. If you have a a grief, if if, if at all possible, put an expiration date on that. Give yourself permission to grieve if your team loses or something doesn't go your way to say, you know what, I'm going I'm to be mad about this for like an hour. I'm going to be mad. Okay, if your kid has a problem, like, you're like, hey, quit. You're like, well, the kid feels what he feels. To say, but okay, you have like 30 minutes to be angry without sinning, without breaking stuff. Don't be going crazy. But you got 30 minutes to, to, to be angry, to be frustrated, and then do your best to put an expiration date on it because holding on to your past will ruin your present. Okay, letting go sets you free. Forgiveness sets you free. And again, God does not chastise them for having the emotion of grief. God has emotions, but there is a time that you've got to let go of it. Ecclesiastes says there's a time for, a time for, a time, there's a time to live, time to die, time, the, the whole thing. Is that a Beatles song? I should have Kristen sing that someday. All right. If you're brand new, I have a little bit of attention deficit um, sometimes. Just, and you're like, yeah, we see that. Uh, Ecclesi- but it makes me creative. Ecclesiastes 3, 4 says this. There's a time to mourn and a time to dance. And I'm sorry, Kevin Bacon, but you misinterpreted that particular scripture. Because what you dance to is really important. And how you dance can be very sinful, ladies. I guess some guys can't be, but I, we don't even go there. Yeah, let's just keep going. Uh, how you dance and matters, what you're dancing, listening to. But Pastor Stephen Furtick of Elevation Church said something in one of his sermons I listened to a couple years back, and I love it. He said, don't, say, don't stay stuck in your story. Don't stay stuck in your story. And I love that. I was like, man, I got I to gotta tell my church family that, okay? Give him the credit for it because he probably thought of it, but I don't know who thought of it, but he said it. And so because he said, I'm going to give him credit, don't stay stuck in your story because we can those of you who know people that they're just stuck in their story, it's what happened, and, and that's the past, and this, and this, is, and God's like, how long are you going to mourn even your own story? How long are you going to stay there? Because I have great things for you, but you got to do the let it go thing. you got to let it go. Why? Because it's got a grip on you. The one thing that you thought was so fun to, to lead is now leading you. And you can stay stuck in your story. There's a time to mourn and there's a time to move on. The Apostle Paul, he said in the New Testament, forgetting what is behind, straining toward what is ahead. I press on. What what was he forgetting? Paul was a murderer. Before he got saved, he, he, in the name of God, was, was persecuting and killing Christians. And he got radically saved and he became an amazing preacher, amazing evangelist, and wrote half of the New Testament. So don't stay stuck in your story because the Apostle Paul could have. He could have said, God, did you see what I did? I was like, yeah. He's like, but you're passionate, and I can use passion. I can use guided passion. And so God tells Samuel here, fill your horn with oil and move on. There, it's taken us 30 minutes to get through one verse. Um, I hope you brought lunch. If not, we'll stay ahead, all right? 2 Samuel chapter 16, 2. Samuel, this is what God says. But Samuel said, he says, okay, go, go tell Jesse. But Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hears about it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, you know, I never thought of that. You're right. So let's see. What can we do? What can we do? What can we do? What can we do? I got it. I got it. Okay. Saul won't know you're going to to anoint a new king. So take a heifer and we're totally going to deceive him. He'll think you're just leading. They just think you're leading the heifer going to a sacrifice. Hey, Saul, what are you doing? Uh, I'm not going to anoint a new king or nothing. I'm just going to go have a barbecue up yonder, Bethlehem. 
No, he, he didn't tell Saul. Let me, let me show you this, because you can read this as if God is telling Saul to be kind of sneaky about it. But let me point out that God never asked Samuel's opinion here. God is talking, and he gets interrupted by Samuel. You ever have that happen? You're telling a story, and they just, if you're married, you've had it happen to you. Right? You, they try to finish your story, and it, and it kind of drives you crazy. But Samuel, he, he, they're going to kill me. He's going to kill me. Fear is what caused Saul to make a bad decision, and now Samuel is afraid of Saul, and he's like telling God, I don't want to do it because Saul's going to kill me. God is big enough to keep Samuel safe from a crazy king. God is big enough to keep you safe in the, great, great, in the places of life that you're not like. So that's not what God says. Here, let's, let's read this, like how it's actually written. Let's take out what Samuel says Samuel said, okay, how can I go, da, da, da. Right before that, God says, I'm sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. Let's, let's take out what Samuel said. Then the Lord said, again, take a heifer, okay, go to, go to Bethlehem, choose one of his sons to be king, take a heifer with you and say, without the interruption, God's like, you done? Because I'm still talking. And we do this. So Samuel's little thing there, God just basically ignores it. Doesn't even say, oh yeah, you're thunder. He's like, no, take a heifer with you and go sacrifice to the Lord and invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what to do. You are to anoint for me the one that I indicate. How often when God tells us to do something, we get this fear and, and as to why it can't work. And with God, all things are possible. Church, of course, it's going to work. And there's partial mission plans. God seldom reveals the entire plan. It, there's objectives. Back when Xbox was popular and I was younger and, and Travis was a, a kid, we played uh, Call of Duty. All right. Now, how many of y'all remember the first Atari in the early 70s? I had, that's, yeah, praise Jesus. There is some people my age uh, where we actually used to have to put the screen on the old TV and we did have a remote control. His name was Stan. It was dad saying, hey, turn it to channel six. And I click, 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 click. Uh, the UHF, VHF, the rabbit ears. Remember those days? Our kids have no idea what it's like. Imagine telling your kid to get up and change the channel these days. They'd be like, what? But on Call of Duty, we, we learned that there was objectives. There was missions. And you didn't think about the whole war. It was like, okay, take this hill. Take this area. And, and that's where I learned, okay, objectives and missions are really important. Because we can, we can mess up the whole war by not taking care of today's objective. Like, get to this point, then you can go on to the next point. Too often we think so far ahead, we don't do anything with today. Complete the mission, then focus on the next one. And that's what God is telling Samuel here. And Samuel did what God said, despite his feelings of fear. He was still afraid, but now there was a plan. Take a heifer, go do, do a sacrifice. And I think at that point, Samuel's like, okay, everything's all right. We're going to be cool. I have a Polaris 500. It's a 2000 model, so it's almost as old as me. And in this Polaris, I bought it used for a friend of mine. And uh, it had a yellow button, has a yellow button on it. I didn't know what it was when I first bought it. And I noticed, though, that when I wanted to go in reverse, that it would hesitate. I'd push on the throttle, it'd be like, bah, 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 bah. and as a mechanic, I'm like, well, there's something not right with this. Forward, everything's great, but reverse, it cuts out. I was telling my friend, what's to do? He's like, oh, there's an override button. It's a yellow button on your left handlebar. You push that button, and it takes off the safety feature so that you can't back over children or anybody in your hunting party that you don't particularly care for, right? You, you, it, so it, it, it keeps you from going backwards too fast is the problem. So you push the override button, you can go back as fast as you want. And what I visualize Samuel doing here is like, this is gonna be kind of scary, but I need the, the, the override button to override my fears because God is bigger than my fears. So I'm gonna push that button called the Holy Spirit, say, Jesus, I need your help because I'm gonna go back and I don't know what's gonna happen. And God's like, I got this, I got you. Just push the override button, do what I've asked you to do. Yes, it's going to be fear, but without fear, you don't have to have any faith. And God has called us to a life of faith. There's an override button that you need to learn how to hit. And here's what they asked. They see him coming. Samuel did what the Lord said. He arrived at Bethlehem. The elders of the town trembled. I mean, they were kind of scary. They were scared when they met him and they asked, do you come in peace? Because they knew Samuel. That was a man who would call down fire from heaven. They knew Samuel in the recent thing where he hacked the king of Agag to death. We talked about this last week. He didn't just kill the king. He hacked him. The word, he just, just went crazy on the guy with the sword. So the elders of the town are like, dude, is this a peace mission? And because as a communicator, my job is to help you remember what I'm preaching. Here's the answer that Samuel gave. Do you come in peace? 
you will remember this. I come in peace. Again, it's my kid's pastor brain that said, okay, I'm going to remember this. Did he come in peace? Yes, he came in peace. He's like, everything's cool. I've just come to, to have a barbecue with you guys. And they got a little bit excited about that. Yes, I've come in peace. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. This particular sacrifice was a fellowship offering. Fellowship offering meant barbecue. That is, and barbecue is biblical. Many times in scripture, there was offerings. There was grain offerings. There was offerings of meat. But I think God's pretty... I think he likes the barbecue because you would do a barbecue and an offering, a peace offering, and the aroma would go up and it was like the aroma was pleasing to God. And that was barbecue. That was barbecue. And I don't want to pick on vegans or vegetarians because I love you. You're healthier than me by far. But I don't think that when you eat a piece of celery, God's like, ah, man, that's good. That tofu, when you open the tofu up, and again, I'm not picking on you. You're healthier than me. Okay? But, but, Somehow, I mean, there was grain, but, but somehow in the barbecue, it was like, God's like, I like barbecue. Barbecue is good. There's a reason that Jesus told Peter in the New Testament, kill and eat. Why do I have a smile on my face? Because I love to kill and eat. I love barbecue. God loves barbecue. This is a barbecue. Now, I know first service, it just had breakfast, but you're ready for lunch, and you're thinking, I probably just promoted Dickie's barbecue, and you're like, this should give me a kickback if you go there. But, th- but there's a barbecue, so they're like, okay, this is good. You have, you have seven boys and a dad that get invited to this barbecue, and they are, like, excited. Like, this is going to be a great, great time. And God's like, I have something to show you. I have something to show you. Now, let me show you a few things in this. Jesse has eight sons. Seven are present. And he's a prophet. God has not revealed everything to him. And something happens in, in verse 5 through 7 that... Oftentimes, we have the same response to it. So I've come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves. Go wash up, boys. Come to the sacrifice with me. And then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. Once again, it's a barbecue. And when they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab. Eliab was the oldest brother. And thought, surely the Lord's anointed stands before me. This, this guy, he's tall, he's dark, he's handsome. Most likely because of the culture, these seven sons were dark hair, probably black hair, dark eyes, taller, well-built. I mean, just good, good good-looking guys. And when he sees Eliab, he's like, that man looks like a king. And I know that this has happened with our young adults group uh, at different times in our church. When they've walked in, they've seen the one. Surely this is the one that the Lord has anointed for me to spend at least two weeks with. I had to throw that in there, right? Let's make sure you're all paying attention. Surely the Lord's anointed stands here. Okay, who, who, is he? who is he again? He's a prophet, right? He knows stuff. And he sees Eliab, and he's like, this guy looks like a king. He talks like a king. He's confident. He's good looking like a king. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his what? Appearance or his, his what? His what? I have some favorite Bible verses. Uh, Do not consider his, what? His height. It's fun when you have the only microphone. Um, Don't consider his appearance or his height. True story. I had a a guy come several years ago that um, he had been watching us online and I was standing at the door greeting people, and he comes walking by me, and I, I shook his hand, and he just kept going, and I'm like, well, he's kind of in a hurry, first time guessing. He was looking for the pastor. <laughs> and uh, I, I finally went and talked to him. I was like, you thought I was taller online, huh? He's like, yeah. It's a true story. He's like, yep. So sorry to disappoint you uh, if you're brand new and thought I was taller online. Uh, I thought it was kind of funny. But God's like, don't consider his appearance or his height. For I have what? I have rejected him. And the Lord does what? Say the word. Does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. God is making a factual statement here. He is not saying you're wrong in doing it. God made people beautiful, right? I mean, he, he, he made us this way. He's not saying that you're wrong and sinful for doing it. He's just saying that's human nature. 
Human nature looks at the outward appearance. We look at the height, we look at whatever they have maybe, and we look at just the things that we think are important that really are not important to God. And, and God has not revealed everything to him. He looks impressive, surely he's the one. And my question here is, have you ever been so sure of something based on what you see, but we're wrong? Several minutes ago, I mentioned exes, okay? And this might be a time where you married somebody where somebody else warned you. They were like, oh, man, I don't know. Because here's, here's when, when good friends tell you this isn't a good idea, that's why they're good friends. And so single people, be very, very, very careful who you marry. Be very careful who you date. Dating is different, but when you get into a relationship and they have different values than you, the end is usually not that good. That's why it's good to have people in your life, and when you, especially young people hear me, when your parents, this is like a communicator's way of showing he's frustrated, like when your parents tell you, and again, I'm not talking about my kids because I love my, all my kids are great, uh, and my sons-in-law are great, but listen to me, when your parents are like, there's warning signs here, listen to your parents, listen, 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 because they see stuff that you don't, why? Because they've been there. Like, seriously, because you, you override, you're like, oh, Pastor Stan said the override button, everybody's telling me don't, but I'm going to, you're going to back them up. Like, you run them over, and then you run over yourself, and you'd be like, I should have listened. That, that is one of the things that a parent really never wants to hear their kids say. I should have listened to you. That, listen before you make the I do. Amen? Amen. All right, that one was for free. It wasn't in the notes. Uh, <laughs> it's all free. Yes, we don't charge here. If, if we charge, nobody would show up, all right? Uh, that's the way it is. This guy looks impressive, but he's not. God makes a factual statement because we can't always see the heart right off, although you will eventually see the fruit. In my notes I wrote down here, hopefully it's not after the I do, okay? I was thinking, Pastor Stevie, we should make up a, like a, you know how when somebody goes for a job, like they put us down as references, like that happens a lot. Hey, Pastor Stevie, my reference, there's my reference. I thought we should do a dating reference form. Like, like, what is the name of your last three exes so I can get a hold of them and really find out what you're like? How many dates would be cut short? I think we're on to something here. Like, a, a dating reference form. How many of y'all would put down your three last exes and, and if they're all, like, making the same statements, run! <laughs> okay? Just go. All right, let's keep this. is not a dating, but maybe some of you needed to hear it. This verse reveals what is really important to God, and that is what's in our hearts. Not our looks, not our abilities. I could title another message, Cute Without Character. Maybe we'll do that sometime. Cute Without Character. You can't determine your looks, your abilities, or your DNA. You can get plastic surgery. You can put on makeup. You can work out. You can look better. You can improve what you are. But what it's really true is that when you have children, you will have you. Like, you can change your face all you want. You can have as much plastic surgery as you want, but you will still reproduce you. The question is, what are you reproducing? Spiritually, we reproduce things because you reproduce what you really are. Uh, you can't determine, I'm sorry, but you can determine your character. Character is a choice, and that's what really matters to God. And that's good news for us because we can develop what matters the most to God. We can improve somewhat on our looks, okay, but that's not what God counts. He's, he's not looking at that. He, that's the proof here is God's like, yeah, I gave that guy a good looking and made him tall and handsome. That's not what I'm after. God's looking for the heart, a character, which comes in the form of our kindness. Because as humans, we really overvalue looks and abilities. God wants to know what kind of heart do you have? Are you kind? Are you loving? Are you patient? Do you treat people well? Are people happy that they met you? Are people excited when they see you? Are people, for the most part, glad that they know you? There's a story I read in the Bible. I was reading it. I think it was, I don't know, I was up at 4.30 this morning. So I, I, I read something. I read something. I read the Bible. I read the Bible. But it said that, that the, matter of fact, I probably shouldn't even tell you this because it's a sermon. No, it, it was basically this, this king died, and it was like his name was Jehoram, and it said that nobody cared. I was like, ouch. This, a whole other sermon. But when we pass, somebody should know. Why? Because we touch their lives. Like Pastor Stevie said this morning, and he, that, that Cunis should know like, that we love them. Like We should reach our community as a beer. How do we do that? We do it one-on-one. -on -one. We do it at the gas station. We do it at the store. 
And goodness sakes, if you're wearing a CLC shirt, you better be nice to people when you're in this town. <laughs> I'll pull your sticker off the car. You, yeah, you don't drive, okay? We used to, we give award like coffee cards if we see a CL, you know, the little sticker. But um, we might have like tickets as well if you're driving nuts <laughs> like that. Let's keep going. And then God does something that's crazy, all right? He sees, he sees Eliab and he's like, no, that's not the one. As humans, again, we overvalue looks and abilities. It's kind of like used car shopping, right? We can be so enamored with the body we don't check to see if the uh, check engine light is on. And we can look at the outward stuff, and that's not what God looks at. But don't let attraction become the distraction. Don't, don't do that. In verses 8 through 11, okay, Samuel's like, I know this has got to be the guy, and it's not the guy. And so he says, he called a Benadab, second born. And he had him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said... And I want you to picture there's the barbecue roasting on the spit or however they did it. It might have been pit barbecue. It's, and he says, I haven't chosen this one either. And Jesse then had Shammah pass by. So Jesse's like sending his sons. And Samuel said, nor has the Lord chosen this one. And Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel. But Samuel said to him, the Lord has not chosen these. And then he asked Jesse, are these all the, this is a prophet of God that should know stuff, but he doesn't. God's keeping it hidden. Are these all the sons you have? Well, they're still the youngest, Jesse answered, and he's out tending the sheep, and Samuel said, well, send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. There's the youngest one, the, the, the least significant, and David was so overlooked that he wasn't even invited to the barbecue. That's a sad deal. Like, you got these seven sons, and then you have David who's out. They, they didn't even think about him, and what, what, was, what was Jesse thinking? Well, he's the youngest. He's out in the field. And so here's what happens next. Sit down for a we will, okay. We will not sit down. What's that mean? There's no, there's no barbecue till he gets here. And so I'm sure they sent either the fastest servant or somebody went and ran. And they're like, hey, Dave, come here, man. They want to, like, you want me? Yeah, they want you. Why do they want me? I don't know. But I'm hungry, so hurry up, man. We're going to eat. All right, next verse. So he sent for him and had him brought in. He was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. Some versions say he was ruddy, ruddy and handsome. Now, again, we've described what scholars believe to be the, the seven sons that were black-haired, dark eyes. But David is described in the Bible as kind of a reddish blonde, maybe a strawberry blonde type hair with like light-colored eyes. That maybe he had green eyes or blue eyes. And, and his description is different than the seven brothers. So we don't know if he had a different mom. Don't know any history with that. But he looked different. He was different, and when he comes bouncing in, the Lord said, rise and anoint him. This is the one. And what I want to tell you today is you may feel overlooked. You may feel that somebody has just put you out in the pasture. You are the least significant of the family. You're the youngest. You're the kid. Again, he could be 10, 12, 15 years old here, probably closer to 10, 12. And he's just out in the field forgotten. He was not invited not invited to the barbecue, overlooked, seemingly insignificant. And what I believe that God wants you to hear today is that if you feel that, if you feel that nobody sees you, that you're meaningless, that you're insignificant, you're the least of these, all you are is a shepherd, which was like the lowest position back in those days, that God sees you, that God sees you, he sees you. He sees you, and he's training you, and you've been going through stuff, and, and he sees you go through the stuff. Pastor Stevie will probably hit this next week of what happened in the field. Like, what was David doing out there? But right now, he comes in, and he's probably looking around going, okay, what's, what's up, guys? I've got sheep to get tended to because he was a very responsible young man. And Samuel gets this oil, and he just dumps it all over his head. And I thought, man, what are the seven brothers thinking? Because they know what oil symbolizes. They know that it's a symbol of authority, a symbol of the Holy Spirit. And they know Samuel, they're like, dude, Samuel just poured oil on his head. Like, what's up with that? We'll see their attitude later down the road when we get into David and Goliath's story. But he said to Samuel, he's the one. And I'm here to tell you today, sons, daughters of God, he's looking at you saying, he's the one. She's the one. The one that I have noticed they may not have the best gifts. They may not sing like an angel. They might not be tall, dark, and handsome, or really good looking, but their heart is beautiful to me. 
They're kind, they're loving, they think about other people. That is what I'm looking for. I'm not looking for somebody that's good looking because I can make a good looking person out of dirt, but I can't make you have good character. I can't make you loving. That's something that you develop in the darkness. And that's what David was. He was in the darkness, the darkness of people's sight, not necessarily outside dark, but but he had those moments. But he was developing, God was developing this young man to be a king later down the road. And I hope that that gives you some, some significance tonight, that when God looked at you, he saw you as valuable. When nobody else saw you, he saw you. And he sent his son to die for you. Why? Because you meant that much for him. You meant that much. So where are you at today? What are you holding on to that you need to let go of? Let me show you what sin is. Sin is, is not a lead rope. Sin is a tow rope. And we hook, we hook on to sin, and it's fun for a while, the Bible says, and we think we're leading that little sin thing around. And all of a sudden, over the course of time, we realize that it's leading us. Right. And Jesus came to set the captives free. And so today, where is your life? I know most of you have given your life to Jesus Christ. I'm going to tell you, keep battling, keep fighting. Don't listen to those lies that the devil tries to say. You're insignificant. No, you're not. Pastor Stevie nailed it. I don't have to preach it. He nailed it. That was a word from God. He's like, I don't want to stupid. I'm like, preach, bro. <laughs> preach it because I'm feeling it, man. Just let it go. That's how we work here. Like, we're a team. Preach it. Okay? Because you're not insignificant. But what I want to talk to you today, just for the next few moments, is those of you who may have never given your life to Jesus Christ. Let me tell you, you were bound by sin. You are. You may think you're not. One thing my son used to do, I love my son, he would fish, and if it was boring, the one that he would catch, he would like let the, just open his bail and let the fish take off. And just, and the fish was like, I'm free. He's like, no, you're not. And click, start reeling it in. You can feel free and not be free. Okay, because the hook of sin doesn't always make you feel captive. And Jesus is here to take the hook out. So if you bow your heads with me just for a moment, I want you to think about that. What, what, what are you holding on to? What's holding on to you that you need to get rid of today? And you cannot get rid of sin on your own. That's the beauty of the cross. Jesus came because he is the only one that can take the hook of sin out of our life and set us free and be truly free. If you've never given your life to Jesus today, guys, I'm serious. There's a heaven and there's a hell. And our decision and what we do with Jesus determines where we go. The Bible is very clear that if we reject Jesus, we are choosing to spend eternity in hell for our own sins for the rest of eternity. But Jesus came so that we didn't have to do that. And all we have to do is believe in our heart, Jesus, you you died for me, and I accept that. I'm a sinner. I need a Savior. I need your forgiveness, and I understand I cannot get to heaven without asking you to be my Lord and my Savior. And I want to do that today. And if that's you today, I'm going to ask you just to be bold and brave. Lift your hand up. I'm not going to point you out or embarrass you in any way. Okay, I see your hand. Anybody else? Okay, come hands in the back. All right, hands in the front. All right, several hands. There's several hands. Lots of hands going up. You can put them down. Jesus saw that hand. You probably got saved right at that moment when your hand went up because you're like, I recognize that. But what I do is lead us through a prayer. It's a simple prayer. And it's a prayer asking God to forgive us and to come into our life. So church family, let's pray together with the several that raised their hands up. And it's a simple prayer. Dear Jesus, I believe you came to die for my sins. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. Come into my life. Be my Lord and Savior. In your name, amen. Amen. Welcome to the family of God. Amen. Welcome. So here's... Here, here's the, the sin drop right there. When you prayed that prayer and you believed it, boom. Because the microphones are way too expensive to drop, amen? But that's a sin drop. Those of you who are serving God, okay, and again, if you raise your hand for salvation, we have a, a gift for you. It's a little booklet. It says it's a new believer's like, okay, I made this decision. What do I do now? Uh, that's at the information table back there in a Bible if you need one. But for those of you who are serving God, I need you to let go of some stuff. I, I want to go back to that first question that God, I believe, is talking to you, saying, how long are you going to mourn for what you lost and you'll never get back? Because I have something good for you. I have something ahead of you. But son, daughter, I, I love you too much to let you stay stuck in your story. I, I love you too much because I got good things for you. There's a new king coming. I just need you to hold on to me and let go of what's holding you back. That's what God's saying to us today. Amen. Anybody accept that? Like that's that hits you hard. One is like, if you're a Christian, you okay, this is for salvation. You're a Christian, you're like, yeah, I need to let go of some stuff. If you do like, just raise your hand. If you need to let go of some stuff, I'm not gonna call you for it. Just it's acknowledgement. Yeah, I do. 
Lord, help them to let it go. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, thank you guys so much for being here. I love y'all. And uh, okay, now uh, appeal to the strong men of our church. Um, here's what we need from you, if you would. Uh, our last six rows um, need to be stacked against the walls because we're going to set tables up for our next steps tonight. Uh, it'll keep our staff from having to stay here too late because they've been here for a long day. Uh, but love y'all. Thank you so much for being here Wednesday night. We have church. And Pastor Dylan will be back to kind of guide you on that. So last six rows only. Have a wonderful day. Five o'clock tonight, we'll give you a tour of the building if you haven't seen it.